Hey everyone, and welcome to Southern War, a podcast about the Southern theater of the American Revolution. I am Ranger William from Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. And I am Ranger Adrian from 96 National Historic Site. Together, we're going to explore some of the well-known and not-so-known stories from the American Revolution here in the American South. Time to make the history. Now, today we are joined by a special guest, uh, Rob Holmes, park ranger from Kings Mountain National Military Park. Rob, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. So to kind of start things out, for people who aren't familiar maybe with the Battle of Kings Mountain, uh, let's start with a little bit of geography. Where would you say Kings Mountain is located today? Um, but also in this idea of the Southern theater of the war, what were some landmarks in the revolution that might help place this on the map? Yeah, sure. Uh, so today in 21st century, we are right along the border between North and South Carolina, about 40 miles roughly west of uh, Charlotte. Uh, not in North Carolina, as people often assume, because of uh, Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which is a town city now that was funded, uh, founded long after the battle was fought here. So geographically, uh, I would call this area the Piedmont, uh, not quite all the way as far west as the, the mountains, uh, definitely not in the low country area. We're in that sort of transitional area geographically where you've got these old rolling hills that were carved uh, by the various uh, streams and rivers over the millennia. All right. So what are some of the um, areas or landmarks that were there during the battle that people might recognize today? Is there anything? During the battle, uh, it's hard to say, not a whole lot, uh, quite frankly. This was um, an area that in the turn, well, in the terms of uh, South Carolina's colonial history had really been acquired fairly recently uh, at the time of the battle around a generation or so earlier. Um, there were some small scattered uh, farmsteads and, and farmhouses, but uh, not a whole lot of other major landmarks. Probably the most important thing that uh, was here at that time uh, was the road that ran through uh, to what was then known as Charlottetown. Uh, today, of course, that being the city of Charlotte. Um, other than that, you had a few uh, fords um, of the, the rivers, but uh, not a whole lot of other landmarks uh, unless you count the mountain itself. Okay. So when was this? When in the war was this battle taking place? So uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain is fought in October. It's uh, the 7th of October in 1780. So fairly later on in the war than most people think of. A lot of the times when we're thinking of the American Revolution, of course, we know those dates like 1775 or 1776, of course, being the battles of Lexington and Concord, uh, and then later on the Declaration of Independence. But this is a war that goes well beyond that. It doesn't officially end until 1783. So we're, in terms of the overall length of the war, fairly close to the middle, but long after the period of time that most of us are familiar with. Awesome. So it's a pretty nice time of year, right? It depends on what your definition of nice time of year is. It had rained the night before the battle, uh, so it was probably fairly soggy. And uh, for some of the groups of the Patriot militia men who fought during the battle, uh, like the over the mountain men, when they were making their way down here to the battle, they had actually crossed over um, snow-covered mountains at the time. So this is a, a you know, it's a bit of a trek, uh, the distance that they cover. So they're going to go through a wide range of uh, different um, seasonal weather experiences, sh uh, shall we say. Uh, I believe it was also fair to say that it was probably much cooler at that time than it is today. Okay, Rob, so we, we understand a little bit of kind of where we're talking about with the Battle of Kings Mountain. We're looking at October 7th, 1780. Um, 
who are going to be some of the, the the big figures, the big players involved in the story of your battle? Sure. So uh, you've got the two different sides who are going to fight. You've got the Loyalists and the Patriots. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with them, the Loyalists, are, of course, are those uh, colonials, um, folks from the, the colonies who decided they wanted to remain loyal to the king. Um, and then the Patriots, of course, are those from the colonies who wanted to uh, get independence and create their own nation. So on the Loyalist side, uh, the probably the most famous participant in the battle is their commander. And that's uh, Major Patrick Ferguson. Um, some places you'll see him referred to as Colonel or Lieutenant Colonel. He had been promoted prior to the battle, but the new commission hadn't received, uh, he hadn't received that yet. So uh, his official rank was still a uh, major at the time. Um, and he was really kind of a famous guy. He was known as the best uh, marksman in the British Army. He had invented his own breech loading uh, flintlock rifle by improving upon some existing technology uh, and to create a weapon that was capable of much higher rates of fire and much greater uh, accuracy than your standard infantry weapons of the day. Um, he had a long military career having served in Europe during the Seven Years War. That's the French and Indian War for us over here. Uh, he'd also served in the West Indies against uh, 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 putting down an insurrection that had happened there. And then prior to the Battle of Kings Mountain, he had also taken part in the Battle of Brandywine uh, outside of um, Philadelphia um, in, in 1778. So he was probably the most famous uh, individual on uh, the field of battle. Um, amongst the Loyalists, there were a few other uh, officers um, of note uh, who are not nearly as well known uh, as Ferguson is, but they've left us uh, diaries and letters and other records. So they're very key witnesses to the battle uh, itself. Uh, I'm speaking of uh, the surgeon, Urzel Johnson, um, uh, Captain DePaster, who uh, ended up being um, Ferguson's second in command, and then uh, another individual named um, Alexander Chesney, who left a, a very detailed uh, diary account of his time in the Southern campaign. Uh, again, although not nearly as well known as Ferguson, these are uh, important individuals on the Loyalist side. Now on the other side, you have the Patriots. And the Patriots are going to have an army that consists of a number of different militia companies, formations that are all gonna come together. So you have kind of a, a who's who of various frontier militia commanders uh, their overall commander is a guy by the name of William Campbell from Virginia. He is going to have a very active career, both at Kings Mountain, and then later on he will he will die. He will succumb to a disease at the Battle of Yorktown. So he's going to be uh, 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 an important individual. Then you've got um, Colonel Severe, uh, uh, Isaac Shelby, uh, uh, James Williams, Benjamin Cleveland, uh, all of these other very important uh, commanders who are going to play their uh, uh, their own role in the course of the battle. Uh, many of whom will have uh, had long careers uh, in the the frontier of the Carolinas, as well as what's today Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, very active for a long time. So I know Will and I have talked a little bit about some of the stuff leading up to the battle since he's, you know, representing the Evermountain Victory Trail. Um, but can you tell us about some of the events that led up to this battle? Sure, of course. Brief overview from the very beginning, of course. Charleston falls in spring, uh, late spring of 1780. Uh, there are other attempts. Uh, General uh, Gates comes down with an, a second Continental Army uh, and is de decisively defeated at the Battle of Camden in August of 1780. And from that point on, organized resistance in South Carolina has pretty much collapsed. The Continental Army has been badly, badly beaten, driven from the field. What's left of it is regrouping in Hillsborough in North Carolina, and there's not really any organized resistance 
left in South Carolina. So in response to this, uh, any resistance to the British invasion, the British forces, is at this point going to rely on partisans, on militiamen. Um, so it becomes this guerrilla conflict. And you've got very skilled, famed uh, leaders on both sides. You've got, um, of course, for the Patriots, Francis Marion. You've got uh, General Sumter. Uh, you've got... Uh, other famous uh, uh, loyalists like uh, Christian Huck, who's eventually defeated later on. But it's this very fierce, this very brutal partisan warfare. And the British very much have the upper hand because of their professional soldiers. They have to disperse their strength a little bit, but these professional soldiers do give them an edge. And while they are able to hold this territory, Patrick Ferguson is made the inspector of militia, and he is tasked with organizing the king's uh, friends, the loyalists, uh, the loyalists uh, militia in South Carolina, uh, so that the professional British army under Lord Cornwallis can begin marching north uh, into North Carolina and from there into Virginia. And Ferguson is very successful in this by all accounts uh according to the returns he's got some four thousand men who are uh, going to sign up under him he has a force directly under him that depending on which source you look at is going to range somewhere between 900 to 1100 men which is a sizable force uh for the period you'd be hard pressed outside of Charleston to find a lot of communities with populations even that were much greater than a thousand people. So this is a, this is a large body of troops that he's moving along. And with Ferguson in the field, with this strong body of loyalist militiamen, Cornwallis uh, feels that he is secure enough to begin his push into uh, North Carolina. And he sets up really a three-pronged approach. Uh, he's got one wing of his army uh, that's going to march to Wilmington, North Carolina, to open up a line of communication to the sea. The Royal Navy is going to be able to bring in supplies. Our, uh, our <laughs> I should say our roads and our infrastructure back in 1780 were appalling where they existed. So, uh, uh, much easier for him to uh, to bring supplies into Wilmington rather than to uh, try to bring them cross country from Charleston or from Camden, uh, even then. So Cornwallis himself will be marching to uh, Charlottetown, which uh, fa uh, falls to him with some minor skirmishing, but not really much resistance on the part of the Patriots. And then Patrick Ferguson is sweeping up on his left along the frontier. And Ferguson, <laughs> he'd been uh, uh, having a frustrating summer, uh, shall we say, trying to chase around these much smaller bands of Patriot militiamen. One of the things that comes up here that makes the story of the Battle of Kings Mountain so fascinating is that when the battle takes place, a good portion of the Patriot forces are not even really on the radar of the British. They're more focused on General Sumter and his men. They, he's the one who they see as, a, as the big threat. Uh, he's an active in the area um, uh, south of Charlotte, the Waxaws along that border area there. And he's the one that they're fo focusing on because he's the one who's the, uh, the greater threat to their supply lines and their lines of communication. They were not really expecting to get this uh, huge response from the backcountry militias and the, the folks from the over mountain regions that they end up getting. And this is where the story gets kind of a little bit mythical, legendary, shall we say, depending on the version of events that you want to get. Uh, there's a strong tradition that a frustrated Patrick Ferguson sends a letter to the frontier communities uh, in the over mountain regions basically telling them to knock off their support for the, the, the rebellion and to, to get back in line, or he's going to come out to their communities and subject them to fire in the sword and, you know, burn them down and, and cause all sorts of devastation. And 
depending on whose accounts you read, it's unclear if that letter was actually sent or not. Uh, no, it's a great story either way. Uh, nonetheless, however they come about it, the folks from the backcountry the, and the over mountain regions, uh, well, they decide that they don't really like Ferguson uh, and what he's been doing. Uh, they feel threatened by him and his presence. Uh, so they decide that they're gonna deal with him. And a large body uh, of these militiamen are gonna march down um, from all over the place, assemble a sizable force, and they're coming from everywhere. Uh, you've got uh, contingents from Georgia, you've got contingents from Virginia, uh, largest contingents, of course, coming from the Carolinas, and the most famous contingent uh, being the over the mountain men uh, from Western uh, North Carolina, Western Virginia, and what's today Tennessee. Of course, like I said, the most famous participants. Uh, they're going to account for about half of the Patriot troops that are gonna be involved um, in the actual battle itself. Uh, some of those over the mountain men, the guys from Virginia are gonna march along a trail uh, that's some, th or some 330 miles long. So they're coming from quite a long distance uh, to give you an idea of just how serious they took the threat posed by Ferguson and his troops. Now, in the 18th century, the sort of security, keeping things secret, uh, you know, very hard to do, much like today. So Ferguson becomes aware that there is a large rebel force out there somewhere. He doesn't know exactly where they are, but he knows they're out there somewhere. And oh, to get, yes. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so because of this threat, he begins moving his forces back towards Charlotte. And that's where uh, Cornwallis is with the main British army. And he's going to follow the roads such as they were. And those roads are going to take him right by Kings Mountain, which was a convenient place for him. It was a high piece of ground. There were a couple of springs of fresh water uh, easily available. He's right on the road. And he's about 40 miles away from Charlotte which is a good day or two ride or march, depending on how you're gonna get here. Uh, so he's got a good line of communication. And he is gonna put his uh, troops on top of Kings Mountain there, set up his encampment. He'll send a message to Lord Cornwallis, asking Cornwallis to send him light infantry and uh, dragoons, those are cavalrymen, uh, because he wants to fight. He wants to fight and win. He doesn't necessarily want to fight at King's Mountain, and that's something that we uh, deal with a lot. Uh, people ask, you know, why was the battle here? Neither side uh, was really planning on fighting a battle at King's Mountain. They didn't set out to do that, uh, especially not for uh, Patrick Ferguson. For him, this was just a convenient place to uh, encamp and await reinforcements. He wanted to get those uh, light infantry and those cavalrymen so that he could then march out face this rebel army, crush them, and then use the light infantry and the cavalry to run them down, to pursue them uh, across hill and dale, uh, and utterly destroy this force. Uh, now, that's what Patrick Ferguson is doing. The militiamen are going to have kind of a, a, an interesting journey. Um, as they are making their way down eventually towards King's Mountain, you've got other units and groups of them coming in and linking up. Um, and they make an attempt to get into contact with the Continental Army at, uh, at Hillsborough. They're looking for somebody to take command. They're looking for a uh, commissioned officer to take command. There uh, was a lot of concern. You've got all of these colonels and other high-ranking officers together from different states. So it wasn't exactly clear-cut uh, in the Patriot Army who, of the, uh, who amongst them should have had command. They don't get a Continental Army officer, so eventually they select William Campbell on the grounds that he is coming the furthest. He has the largest single body of troops under his command, and he's a Virginian. So they don't have to deal with any rivalry amongst the various commanders from North and South Carolina, possibly refusing to follow each other's orders out of personal uh, grievance, ego, rivalry, and things like that. So this is a very smart decision. 
they do almost get sidetracked at one point. Uh, there's some thought that Ferguson had actually gone down to 96. So they almost get diverted to go down there. Uh, though at the last minute they get actual intelligence that tells them that uh, Ferguson is indeed on King's Mountain. So they turn themselves around, march out um, after a rather uncomfortable uh, moment or a day or so uh, encamped at uh, cow pens. Uh, they get a picked force of around 900 to 1,000, every man who can be mounted. And from there, they're going to march over to King's Mountain where they'll fight the battle. So I had a question. Why is it called King's Mountain? Is it named for the king? That's an excellent question. Uh, not really named for the king. It's uh, best as we can figure, best as anybody's been able to find out. It was a name for a guy whose last name was King. So no connection to any King George or King William, any of those early English uh, monarchs, just a local sort of landowner, frontiersman, whose last name was King and uh, decided uh, that this was his mountain. Okay, makes sense. And little did he know the questions he would cause centuries later. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. So talking about the Battle of Kings Mountain, you've got all these frontiersmen, these patriot groups coming together, pursuing Ferguson. They find him on Kings Mountain. They attack. Is there a good way to lay out how the battle happened being such a, a brawl? Is there a good way to approach and examine the fighting? And also, do we know if the Ferguson rifle saw use at the Battle of Kings Mountain? So I'll deal with uh, your second question first about the Ferguson rifle. And that really depends on a whole lot of factors uh, on what you feel qualifies as acceptable evidence. Ferguson's rifle is going to be used during the Battle of Brandywine in 1778. Ferguson is himself wounded in that battle. Um, his, his unit of riflemen, which was a sort of a temporary formation at that time, is broken up. Those men are sent back to their original units. And from that point, it's very unclear what actually happens to the Ferguson rifles, whether they were returned into the uh, the ordnance stores, whether the men who went back to their original units kept them, or just what exactly happened to them. Uh, uh, Ferguson probably had some of them with him himself as his personal weapons, uh, but the he had maybe 100 to 200 manufactured, so it's unclear what exactly happened to all of them. Now, in the, after, in the aftermath of the battle itself, we don't have any direct sources, uh, no records, no returns of captured arms, anything like that, where they list Ferguson rifles. Okay. Uh, not, nonetheless, there have been some folks who have looked at other pieces of evidence, uh, some bullets recovered from the battlefield, the uh, the cock or the hammer from a flintlock uh, firearm, uh, both of which have been identified as being a bullet fired from a Ferguson and the cock or the hammer of a Ferguson rifle. To me, that evidence personally isn't the smoking gun, no pun intended, uh, to say with any certainty that the Ferguson rifle was both at the battle and used at the battle. And I think that's an important distinction that needs to be made because it's quite possible, and I would argue likely even, that Ferguson would have had some of uh, his rifles amongst his baggage. Whether those rifles were issued and then fired in anger during the battle is a different issue. Um, in terms of why there is no record of them after the battle itself, uh, my feeling is that while the Ferguson rifle was known to some people, it was not as well known amongst uh, the general populace then as perhaps it is today. So it's quite possible that if a Ferguson rifle was recovered by one of these frontiersmen from the back country who didn't know what it was, who didn't know how to operate it because it's not the most um, intuitive 
uh, firearm for loading and firing, they might have just looked at it and gone, oh, this is broken or this doesn't work and trashed it, used it for different parts uh, or something like that. Um, so I've hedged my answer in as many different ways as possible uh, to avoid committing to any specific answer on this. Uh, I'd very much like to think that it was here and that it may have been used, but uh, if it was used, it was certainly not in great enough numbers to have made any significant or had any significant impact on the battle. As your second question, uh, how can we think of how do we approach the battle itself? Um, so Ferguson and his men are going to be encamped on top of uh, Kings Mountain. Uh, they had not made any efforts to fortify their position, uh, not really circling the wagons, digging trenches, creating fences and things like that. They had posted some sentries, uh, but these sentries really didn't do a very good job of letting them uh, know that this force of patriots, of frontiersmen, was approaching them. The patriots are going to approach Kings Mountain uh, from the west, from the direction roughly of uh, Cowpens National Battlefield today. They're going to arrive at a spot roughly a mile, three quarters of a mile away from Kings Mountain. They will dismount off their horses. A small number of them will be left behind to watch the horses to make sure they don't get away. And then they're going to split themselves into two columns. And the reason why they're going to do this is because they're looking to encircle Kings Mountain to make sure that Ferguson and his forces have no way of escaping back to Charlotte, back to Cornwallis, uh, to a place where they can be safe. So when they do this, uh, they, of course, they don't have cell phones. They don't have walkie-talkies. They don't have digital watches or things like that. So how do you coordinate a thousand men getting in line, getting in position, and arriving at the same place at the same time? So when the fighting begins, there's a 15-minute interval roughly, between the point where the fighting begins and when the entire Patriot force is in position to be able to engage uh, Ferguson and uh, his loyalists. So the first thing that happens, uh, they come into contact with uh, the pickets, with Ferguson's sentries. Most of them appear to have been taken out nearly instantaneously without being able to be warned, though eventually uh, one is... Uh, able to give the alarm and alert Ferguson and uh, the Loyalists that the Patriots are here. And that's really the first instant at which Ferguson becomes aware that this Patriot force is this close to him. You recall what I said before, he knew they were somewhere out there, but he didn't know where they were. Communications were very poor, and the Patriots had also, quite frankly, done a very good job of intercepting all of the messengers and all of the scouts who had gone out uh, or had been trying to get into communication with him. So on our battlefield, uh, if you follow our trail, at the highest point really on Kings Mountain, you've got sort of a, a, a monument that's known as the Centennial Monument. And this is a stepped-shaped uh, step -shaped monument, kind of a rough obelisk shape. And it's on this end of Kings Mountain where the fighting is going to begin. Uh, that's where the Patriots are going to first come into contact with uh, Ferguson's loyalists. Well, it takes the rest of them who have to go further all the way to get around on the other side of the mountain and then uh, engage Ferguson's troops. And they have some difficulties with this. There's one contingent under a Major Winston who actually charges up the wrong hill, uh, which you can see <laughs> is right behind our visitor center. There's a, a false rise where it rises up. And if you're standing at our visitor center looking out there, it looks like, oh yes, that's of course, that's where Kings Mountain goes up. But if you go up on the top of it, it then goes down on the other side before rising once again uh, to Kings Mountain. So Major Winston's uh, Patriot uh, militia, they charge up this rise thinking that they're getting up to where uh, the loyalists are, arrive at the top of it and then realize, oh no, we have to go down and up again. So, like I said, there were some there were some difficulties with getting everybody into position. I have always yeah. wondered where that ridge was that I've heard about this false attack. So thank you for laying that out. 
Yeah, and of course, absolutely. Uh, that's one of my favorite uh, tidbits uh, from the battlefield. Uh, now, Ferguson does respond with energy uh, and uh, decisiveness uh, in, to this attack, getting his men together and organizing them to defend Kings Mountain as much as they possibly can. However, the speed of the Patriot attack and the suddenness really puts uh, him on the back foot into what he can actually accomplish. Amongst Ferguson's forces is a sort of semi, well, it's, it's fair to call them an elite unit on, uh, for this battle. Uh, this was 120 provincials. Now, one of the things that makes this battle uh, unique is that the only British soldier involved in the battle is Patrick Ferguson. Almost everybody else is uh, an American. There's somebody from the colonies, either somebody who emigrated here or somebody who was born here. The provincials were colonists who had joined the British Army to serve as uh, professional soldiers, not as militia, but as professional soldiers. And most of them are going to come from Connecticut, New Jersey, New York. They're from the Northeast. Uh, one of the disadvantages of being a provincial, a loyalist, is that you served at the pleasure of the king. So whereas the Patriot militiamen get to serve in their local communities, the uh, provincials, they go where the king tells them to do. So Ferguson takes these professional soldiers, he has them fix bayonets and charge down the side of King's Mountain to try and drive off the Patriot uh, militiamen. Now, today to us in the 21st century, we would look at this and go, wow, that's ridiculous. Of course that wasn't going to work. <laughs> However, we have to look back and put ourselves in the shoes of those soldiers in the 18th century. Another thing that makes the Battle of Kings Mountain unique is that the soldiers are using uh, a very large proportion of flintlock rifles along with their flintlock muskets. Now, a flintlock rifle is a firearm with spirals, grooves inside the barrel. It allows that weapon to fire a projectile that's going to go further, faster, and more accurately. Now, the downside of this is that a flintlock rifle is much more expensive to make. Uh, the wooden stock is a lot weaker, and it can take up to a full minute to reload. Now, your flintlock musket, which is your standard infantry arm, fires a much larger projectile, we're talking 69 to 75 caliber projectile, so a very big bullet. Uh, it's not rifled, it's smooth bore, so it doesn't have the same uh, level of accuracy. Um, it has a range of between 150 to 300 yards, uh, though you're not really ever going to have a distance where you can see 300 yards in the woods to shoot at something. Uh, very effectively. So even that advantage between the two is kind of negated. Uh, and with the flintlock musket, you can, a well, a well-trained soldier is going to be able to load and fire in approximately 20 seconds. So with the rifle, you're talking a well-aimed uh, shot with greater range and accuracy being uh, delivered once a minute, as opposed to the flintlock musket, where you've got three to four rounds uh, with less range, less accuracy, uh, but a much higher rate of fire. The crucial difference between the two is that the musket can be fitted with a bayonet and the rifle cannot. And that might not seem like a big deal, but if you're taking a full minute to reload your weapon, well, I can cover a lot of ground running at you in a full minute, especially when I've got a six foot long spear and I'm running at you downhill. Uh, so most people are not going to stand and let somebody come running at them with a six foot long spear. Uh, so charging at them in this way was actually a very effective tactic to create panic, disorder, and drive uh, the Patriots away uh, down from Kings Mountain. Now, it, in this instance, it didn't work out quite so well. The Patriots uh, were numerous enough, their lines were elastic enough that they ran away when uh, the provincials charged down the hill, uh, down Kings Mountain at them, down a gully, up a ravine on the other side, and kept going. And in the meantime, the other militiamen, the other Patriots who weren't running away, well, they were taking shots at those provincials and dropping them. And the 
provincials would charge down Kings Mountain, drive the Patriots away. Then they'd have to struggle back up Kings Mountain, reform themselves. Of course, the Patriots are going to come right back up to where they were. The provincials would then turn around, be ordered to deliver another bayonet charge, and so on and so forth. And they would repeat this three or four times. And each time they repeat this endeavor, more and more of those provincials are uh, going to be disabled. They're going to be killed, they're going to be wounded, and they're going to be no longer able to participate in the fighting. And as this plays out, of course, the rest of the Patriot units are moving into position. They're completing uh, their ring around Kings Mountain. They're fighting their way up the side. And eventually the Patriot units under Shelby, uh, Severe, and Campbell are going to be able to gra uh, gain the heights of Kings Mountain, which at one end is fairly high, and then it slopes down a couple hundred feet towards the other end. And once the Patriots get up to that uh, high point, they're going to be able to deliver not only enfilading fire, but also defilating fire, which means that the Loyalists are taking fire from all sides and from a raised position down onto them. And they're going to force the Loyalists down into this smaller and smaller area on the lower end of Kings Mountain. And as this happens, they're becoming more disorganized. More and more of these units of uh, Patriot militiamen are coming into the battle. They're able to get involved, get themselves in, uh, into the fight, and all order begins to break down uh, amongst the Loyalists. And many of them at this point are starting to try and surrender. Uh, Patrick Ferguson is having none of this. Uh, he's knocking down their white flags. He's throwing everything he can to rally his men. Uh, eventually, he sees that things are not going well. He gathers every one of his officers together with him, everybody who's got a horse. He gets 10 men mounted on their horses, and he leads a charge uh, at the Patriot lines. And there's some debate here what exactly he was trying to accomplish. And it depends on what type of man you think he was. Some people will tell you that he was trying to break through the Patriot lines to escape, to avoid capture. Like I said, he was the most famous uh, individual on the field of battle. He was very well known. And it would have been a big blow uh, to the British operations in the Carolinas if he was captured. Um, others will tell you that he was trying to uh, break through the Patriot lines uh, to lead his men out to cause a breakthrough so that they could escape, um, which is also plausible. A guy on a horse riding at you with a three foot long saber is a very intimidating thing, especially when there's more than one of them charging at you downhill. Uh, most people are not going to stand uh stand still and let a horse run them over. Uh, you have to get a lot of training in the 18th century before you're a soldier who's willing to do that. And uh, you also have to have bayonets, which were kind of a expensive little bit of extra uh, equipment that a lot of these militiamen probably didn't have uh, because, like I said, they were expensive. And if you had a rifle, well, you couldn't use one with your rifle anyway, so why would you bother having that? Um, Regardless of what Ferguson's intentions were, he's unsuccessful. The Patriot forces uh, draw a bead on him, and uh, he goes down under a blaze of fire. Um, there's nine men who claim to have shot him. Uh, his body is found to have been struck by seven uh, musket balls, so he is just shot down, as are most of the officers and the other mounted uh, uh, individuals who are with him. And once Ferguson is killed in this way, um, his second in command, Captain DePaster, realizes that all is lost and he will attempt to surrender. It takes him a couple of uh, tries to get uh, his surrender accepted in the heat of battle uh, with all of these different Patriot units working together, the command and control becomes a little jumbled, and they do shoot quite a few of the loyalists who are attempting to surrender before their officers gain control of them at the end of the battle. So Rob, what was the, um, the landscape like at the time? Like, were there, Was it fields? Was it trees? What was it? Well, when you come and visit the park today, it's kind of interesting. Uh, in a lot of ways, the landscape is simultaneously both very much like what you're going to see, and also nothing at all like you're going to see. 
And what I mean by that is that it was a forested wilderness area, but not the forest of the type that you're going to see here. Uh, in 1780, they had an old growth forest. So we're talking enormous trees, hundreds of years old, very thick. Uh, these trees are going to be very spread apart. There's not going to be much at all in the way of underbrush. And they're going to be tall enough that they create sort of a canopy over the, uh, the terrain. Um, if you think of like a rainforest canopy, it, same sort of idea, though, of course, not with uh, all of the, the jungle uh, animals and, and things like that. The forest that you're going to see today is a new growth forest. So there are a lot of trees. They're much younger. They're much smaller. And there's a lot of underbrush that wouldn't have been there at the time of the battle. And then, of course, you also have to get rid of the very nice, well-maintained roads. Uh, nothing like that would have been here uh, at the time of the battle. And my understanding cool. as well is that when you're looking at the, the after the war history of the park, you saw attempted farming and logging. I mean, what kind of changes has the park undergone to result in this new forest? Sure. Uh, yeah, like you said, there was uh, logging. There was farming. It's an area that's very close to Charlotte, but an area that's not going to be developed uh, in quite the same way. <laughs> and um, part of that has to do with the battle itself. Um, in its aftermath, those who were killed are not buried particularly well. Uh, and the local animals, the wolves, the hogs, the dogs, foxes, get in amongst uh, those uh, uh, dead bodies. And as a result, the area develops a reputation as someplace that you don't necessarily want to be uh, for a while. So it's not until some 30 years later, really, that uh, there's somebody who comes back to try and uh, do something on the battlefield. In the meantime, uh, there are uh, some other attempts. Uh, we have the Hauser House, which uh, is a stone farm house built in the mid-1790s uh, to try and do some farming in the area. And there's a few other uh, farms that were uh, established after that, but mostly farming and I'm going to say smaller scale agriculture for the area, not the large, enormous plantations uh, that you'd see in the low countries, uh, the low country rather, uh, much smaller agriculture than that. So bringing us back to the revolution, um, talking about the, the after effects, what do you see happen because of this battle? When you're looking at the Southern theater of the war, how does Kings Mountain, how does this death of Ferguson, how does this Patriot victory change anything? Well, uh, it, it's a turning point to be sure, because it creates a threat to Cornwallis's rear in South Carolina to his control over the region, to his lines of communication, and to his supplies. And this forces him to turn back his attention to South Carolina when he had been hoping to march further north across North Carolina and to Virginia. Uh, the tide, the momentum has turned, and he has to deal with this. And a few months after the Battle of Kings Mountain, you of course have the Battle of Cowpens uh, with Daniel Morgan and, and Tarleton uh, after their uh, march, which is really not too far away from uh, Kings Mountain, um, both in terms of time, it being in January and Kings Mountain being in uh, October, uh, and in geography. It's probably only... 40 or so miles apart from each other, I think, as the crow flies. So it's another large battle that happens in the same area. Uh, in the aftermath of Kings Mountain, the Patriot forces, the Patriot cause in South Carolina uh, has, re cause, has a, a renewed optimism. Uh, you know, maybe we can win. Maybe it's not over. Uh, we can still win these impressive battles. So there's a shift in people's perception of how viable uh, victory is, how viable resistance uh, can be, how viable this idea of creating this new country is possibly going to be. There are those who were 
maybe sympathetic to uh, the loyalists who are now going to rethink their position. There are those who are sympathetic to the patriots who are now going to say, hey, no more fence sitting. Let's get involved. Let's get in there. Let's fight. Let's resist. So it turns the tide in terms of the military strength of British forces and patriot forces. It probably doesn't change that calculus too much, but what it does change is people's perception, and that's going to be key. We all have probably heard that tired phrase, perception uh, is reality. So by changing the way in which people perceive uh, the campaign and how it's going, it changes the whole nature of the conflict. So I know you mentioned one thing, but what are some of your favorite details about the battle and what do you think people should really see when they visit the park today? So I'm a big military history person, especially 18th century military history. Um, so the things of the battle that I find that are most interesting uh, is that it's an infantryman's fight. There's no cavalry. There's no artillery involved. Uh, you're seeing bayonets. You're seeing uh, flintlock rifles. You're seeing flintlock muskets. I also enjoy, uh, I think that the, the way this battle goes down, it's sort of this cl classic 18th century frontier warfare style uh, in which one force is surprised and surrounded um, and then has to fight it out. And this is going to happen time and time and time again, uh, all throughout the colonial period and uh, the period of the early republic, uh, before the Civil War as well. You'll see it in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, uh, at places um, like uh, St. Clair's defeat in the Wabash, the largest uh, proportional defeat ever suffered by the U.S. Army uh, in the 1790s. You'll see the same thing at the Battle of Bushy Run in Pennsylvania, where a group of British Highlanders get surrounded by uh, Pontiac's uh, Native Americans <laughs> And actually, in that instance, managed to successfully fight their way out uh, with their bayonets. So the similarities uh, between all of these other battles, um, I think, is really fascinating, along with the military technology that's involved. As for what people should see, well, first and foremost, let me, uh, let me push our visitor center, because it is fantastic. Uh, we have a wonderful mu uh, movie with uh, a great... Um, theater where you can go and you can sit down. Some amazing exhibits in our museum. We actually have one of those Ferguson rifles uh, on display. Uh, unclear if this was in any way associated with the Battle of Kings Mountain, but it is uh, an officer's style uh, or NCO style Ferguson rifle. And there's only about six or seven of those in the United States that I'm aware of. There might be a couple over in the UK, but there's only a handful of them uh, anywhere. And we have one right here. So that's super special. And you definitely don't want to miss that. Uh, then, of course, there's the battlefield. And we have so many monuments and memorials out there for all of the various commanders um, of the militia units uh, who fought. We have our centennial marker that I mentioned earlier in the site where the British soldiers, uh, the British, uh, uh, the, the loyalists surrender, we have the U.S. monument, which is really kind of a scale replica of the Washington monument in D.C. Uh, and that's really cool to me because I used to work in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the actual Washington uh, monument in D.C., uh, the capstone at the very top of it is this aluminum pyramid because when they made it, aluminum was a precious metal. And if you look at the top of our monument, you can actually see where they they put a little uh, a bit of bronze up there to simulate that uh, that aluminum cap on the actual Washington Monument, which is uh, just fascinating to me. It's those uh, those attention to details. And then, um, notably, back in 2016, uh, we added a, an uh, African American Patriots uh, memorial. Uh, on the battlefield. Uh, to the three known African-Americans who fought in the battle, there were five uh, total, uh, though the other two we've not been able to successfully uh, 
track down the, the, the sources to say with the level of certainty that we wish we were able to say. And then there were possibly as many as 12. So it's nice that uh, we were finally able to give them the uh, recognition they deserve. However, the one monument that you absolutely don't want to miss is Patrick Ferguson's grave. When Patrick Ferguson was uh, killed at the end of the battle, the loyalists, his men, uh, buried him at the foot of King's Mountain. And he was really the only individual killed in the battle who was given a proper burial. Everybody else was buried in a very rushed manner. So for all of the others, the Patriots and the Loyalists, we don't really know where their remains ended up. Patrick Ferguson's we do. And there is a nice stone marker on it that was put in uh, place in 1930. And it also has a large pile of stones. And this is known as a cane. And it's a Scottish tradition where you would honor a, an important individual by creating a large pile of rocks on top of their burial place. Of course, here in the Carolinas, we have a slightly different tradition about that pile of rocks, which is that those rocks are there to make sure that Patrick Ferguson stays in place uh, right down there where he's supposed to be. Got to love those stories. Um, so if someone was wanting to kind of follow up, learn a little bit more information about the Battle of Kings Mountain, what are kind of your top, for, top three recommended sources? My top three recommended sources. That's an excellent question. Um, so most of them are ones that you're going to be able to find in the bookstore in the visitor center. Uh, we have uh, one called Before They Were Heroes, um, which is a very long book. But uh, it tells the story of the men who fought at Kings Mountain from before the war, uh, uh, before the war uh, began to the immediate aftermath of the war. And that's probably um, your standard, your, your best source. Uh, there's the classic uh, Buchanan's Road to Guilford Courthouse. Uh, Buchanan, of course, being the big eminent historian of the Southern campaign. Um, so that's one of the standard ones that I'd highly recommend um, as well. Uh, there's also one that was put out by Rutledge, uh, the publishing company, uh, I think in 2019, but it covers both the Battle of Kings Mountain and uh, Cowpens. So it's the Battles of Kings Mountain and uh, Cowpens. But if you are big into the military history aspect of it, uh, as I am, you can just go to the uh, U.S. Army and they have put out a staff ride booklet that's only about 150 pages uh, and will take you through the uh, battle as it developed uh, tactically from the perspective of somebody uh, in the modern uh, U.S. Armed Forces. That one it is uh, interesting because you can purchase a copy of it, uh, and the U.S. Army does also make it available uh, in PDF format for free online. Fantastic. Always good to know where we can get some more info. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Ron, for joining us today. That's going to conclude another episode of Southern War, a podcast about the Southern theater of the American Revolution. To learn more about the American Revolution and our home national park sites, check out www.nps.gov slash NISI for Ranger Adrian at 96 National Historic Site, www.nps.gov slash OVVI for Ranger William at Over Mountain Victory National Historic Trail, and www.nps.gov slash K-I-M-O um, for Ranger Rob at Kings Mountain National Military Park. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed it, and that we will see you next time we revisit the Southern Theater of the American Revolution. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.